Welcome to Turning the Page, Lexington Public Library's podcast where we discuss library happenings, take a behind-the-scenes look at different parts of the library, and of course, book recommendations and author interviews. I'm your host, Jennifer. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Today's guest on Turning the Page is Caitlin Hill. Caitlin Hill is a writer, reader, and sweet tea enthusiast who believes that all the world is not, in fact, a stage, but a romance novel waiting to happen. She lives with her real-life romance hero in Lexington, Kentucky. Caitlin is the author of Love from Scratch and Not Here to Save Friends. Find her on Twitter and Instagram at Caitlin Hill and at thecaitlinhill.com. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Caitlin. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad. Why don't you introduce yourself to the listeners of Turning the Page? Sure. I am Caitlin Hill. I am from Lexington originally and have spent most of my life here. I went to Transylvania University and bounced around to a few different jobs after my college experience, including working at the library as yes, a library that's assistant. That's how I met you. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yes. And that was my favorite job I had for sure. And then I sold my first book and now I'm a full-time writer publishing young adult fiction novels so far. And I love reading and writing. I'm excited to do this kind of podcast and yeah, books are my life. <laughs> <laughs> I think I knew that the very first time I ever met you. <laughs> when I think I interviewed you and your phone screen, I thought, this girl's like a book, definitely a book person. <laughs> she needs to be one of us. <laughs> yes, it is much of my personality. So I'm going to ask you a few questions so we can chat about books since that's your love and that's definitely my love. So when did you know that you wanted to be a writer and did you take any writing classes? Yeah, so I think I... I mean, everyone go, comes to writing in a different way. I think I am different from a lot of writers I know in that I totally did not like grow up thinking that this was a thing I wanted to do. I was always a big reader, but didn't really know that writing was an actual job you could do or a career you could have. And I think I kind of just didn't think of the arts in general as like much of an option. I was always really pressuring myself to like find my passion and something really that I I thought objectively would be like more high powered and I don't know stem <laughs> subjects or something. or something yeah yeah I thought I yeah I honestly like thought I was into politics at one point I'm like thank god I didn't actually go that route I would have been terrible um, but yeah towards the end of college I was still unsure what I wanted to do I studied sociology and anthropology which are super open ended yeah. subjects and I hadn't really done a lot of reading for fun during school, just a lot of stuff <laughs> for school. And so I sort of my senior year got back into reading for fun for the first time in a few years. And it was like this escape kind of feeling. And I rediscovered that love that I'd always had as a kid for reading. And meanwhile, I was really stressed thinking about what comes next, not even realizing that it was kind of right in front of me with what I was doing and really enjoying. And then I would, you know, close the book and be like, okay, but now I need to figure out what I love to do. And, <laughs> um, and but it's right just, there. <laughs> yes, it was just not super clear to me yet. But yeah, I had written a blog when I was in college a little bit when I did some study abroad stuff just about to remember what I'd done while I was traveling and update people back home. And I had a lot of fun doing that and always got a lot of nice like feedback from that. And so it had kind of gotten the wheels turning between that and doing more light reading again, where I was just wondering if I could ever do fiction. And so uh, my last semester of college, I took one creative writing class, which is the only one I've ever had still. And it was a fiction workshop on focusing mainly on the short story, which is totally different than novel writing. Right. <laughs> um, and I found that I do not love writing short stories and was not great at it. But it was still good practice to actually just start trying to write fiction and let people read what you write, which is totally different than letting people read like my academic writing and stuff. Right. So that was my main, like, education, formal education I had in it. But from there, I just really got obsessed with reading again and read 
so many more books than I have in my whole life, kind of in the few years after college. And that was my main like study in how to write fiction, I think, was just reading uh, widely in the genres that I was interested in as mm-hmm. I was starting to practice and writing in them. And yeah, I still feel like I learn all the time from books I read and oh, yeah. take a lot in that way. So yeah, that I remember is my- us having many conversations at the cert desk about whatever new teen book was coming out or yeah. <laughs> that we had similar taste in certain things when it came to teen fiction, I guess I would say. Yeah, totally. And, and there's so many, so many really good writers out there in this genre right now that you're in a good niche of where, you know, yeah. you are right now. The young adult genres like had just a huge boom in the past decade, really. Mm -hmm, For sure. Uh, Since you had Twilight and the Hunger Games, basically, that kicked off just an explosion of young adult literature. And not just in those genres, but in things like I write that are contemporary and don't have vampires and dystopian stuff. But just it's huge now. And there's so many people doing so many interesting things in it that I learn a lot from. Yeah, that's great. So your first book is a teen romance. What about the genre really speaks to you? Yeah, I <laughs> definitely have always read since since I was beginning to read, I feel like I was reading love stories and even as just a little kid I was into the princess movies and stories and stuff like that and everyone getting there happily ever after. <laughs> but yeah, why I kind of became a lot of what I read as an actual young adult, like Sarah Dessen and the people of my youth who were doing that. But one thing that definitely sticks out, I think, in my being my gravitating towards young adult is that I met my now husband in high school. And so I had a young adult love story yeah. that, yeah, that's a funny trend, I think, among some young adult authors that often they'll have like had some significant formative experience with like their meeting their life partner really young or like you had some super dramatic high school experience that you find really fun to kind of play with and write about right right but yeah i think it's just a fascinating time to explore in fiction and there's so many changes happening super quickly for both just like in your mind and your heart and also all around you um, as you're just growing up and figuring out what you do after you graduate high school and things like that. All these like feelings that you are just not going to experience at this rate again, really, and changes that you're not going to really experience at this fast again, I feel like. And first love, I think, is so interesting as you're learning who you are and what you want out of a relationship and a partner, what your needs and boundaries are. And there's a lot to be learned from it, but it's also just a lot of fun and doesn't have to have a ton of pressure yet of this is my life partner and we're going to get married. And right. Are we going to have kids and are we going to file yes. taxes together? And right. All of that. Not all the mundane things. It's all yeah. the fun things. Yes. Right. You know, that's great. So talk to us how you were able to pitch your idea for your book to publishers and what was it a long process and how does it work? Yeah, I have gone the traditional publishing route, which means that I did not want to try to publish my book myself, which it's kind of there's a bit of a dichotomy between traditional publishing and self-publishing. So I can only speak to the traditional publishing process that I chose to pursue because self-publishing just requires a ton of hustle and like being able to promote yourself and do all of the business side of things yourself. And I don't really know what I'm doing there. Not that I necessarily felt like I knew what I was doing with my writing either, but I feel like I can control that. And yes, I wanted someone else to tell me and handle all the selling it to bookstores and right, things like that. Social media aspects and all that type of stuff. Yeah. So basically when I decided I was going to try to pursue traditional publishing, I did a ton of research and there's, yeah, just a lot of information out there scattered on the internet. There's not a very good one-stop shop guide to all this that I ever found, but I did a lot of research and learned that basically if I was going to do traditional publishing, I needed to first get a literary agent. 
And so uh, you query literary agents with your book when it's finished. You send out letters, emails, not physical right. letters, to agents that you're interested in who represent the same kind of things that you write and you think might be a good fit. And you send them a letter that's a query letter and it says, this is what my book's about and this is who I am and why I wrote it and things like that in one page, basically. And the first few pages or first chapter of your book. And yeah, I did that with one book that I wrote before Love from Scratch and got a little interest in it, but it, I was still just pretty naive about a lot of the process and didn't feel totally right about that book. I kind of rushed into that. And at the same time that I had started querying that, I had the idea for Love from Scratch. So I sort of put the other one back on the shelf and wrote the first draft of Love from Scratch. With that, I entered this mentoring contest that unfortunately no, no longer exists. It was called Pitch Wars. And I got mentored basically in revising the manuscript. And from there, there was an agent showcase at the end that literary agents could look at the pitch of your book and say, I'm interested in reading more. And from there, you basically query them like normal. But that's how I wow. connected with my agent. And so I sent her the book and she offered representation. So that's the first step. And then from there, your agent submits it to publishers. And so after I did a little bit more revision with her, she took the book out on submission to editors at all of the major publishing houses. And you that's a whole process that can be really both parts of this process so far can be really long. And, <laughs> Sounds like very um, tedious and long. <laughs> yes, and can involve a ton of rejection along the way, um, which I did get some of in the agent process and then on the editor side. When we took the book out on submission at first, I got a few rejections, but overall I had a very, very fortunate journey with that and didn't have a super long wait before my editor had read it and offered on it. So oh, wow. I feel like I, in a lot of ways, had it's definitely a combination of hard work and talent, but also luck and timing. And so in a lot of ways, I think I had a pretty charmed journey with my book landing on the right desk at the right time. <laughs> and For sure. Yeah. It's hard to publish. I mean, it's hard yes. to get someone to even like look at your work. So totally. I think that's why I wanted to ask you this question because I've talked to other people who have written something and, and just get one rejection after other, but they continue to try. But this idea of the pitch wars, I, I remember when that was going on for you. Uh -huh. And I thought that was fascinating. It's unfortunate that they're not doing that again, because I just think of how many great writers out there there might be missing out on what a wonderful idea. Yes. You know? So that was, yeah, that was super helpful to me. And uh, even if I hadn't gotten connected with my agent from it, it taught me a lot about how to revise a book in a short time and uh, connected me with a lot of people who are still my writing peers now. And we right. send each other work and things like that and talk all the time. But yeah, in general, writing and trying to publish can be a very tough, rejection-filled, isolating process. So yeah, the mentorship program was great for me to find. And there are others that exist like it. Like there's, right. there's others out there for sure. And it's also not automatic guarantee that your book will get published no. basically because <laughs> people sure. have totally all different experiences with it. But for me, it was really, really helpful. And it was all also interesting timing because it was fall of 2019 that I did this program. And then the showcase was in February of 2020. I signed with my agent in March 2020, like the week before everything shut down. And so a part of my process, too, was just that when my book went out on submission, it was late spring 2020, early summer, and editors were largely looking for happy, fun, escapist reads. <laughs> and right. so I had a lot of luck with just, here's this like totally fluffy romantic comedy. Enjoy. Right. Woo, all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, yeah, the pandemic has gone a lot of different ways for a lot of different people in publishing. And fortunately, in that case, 
it did not hinder the process for me. That's true. Yeah. (laughs) Are there authors that you really love? And is there a book that you think everyone should read? Okay. There are so many authors that I love and so many romance authors are just prolific. And so if you find one you like, you have 25 million books of theirs to read. So I do mainly read romance, both adult and young adult, and feel like I learn a lot from reading it. Romance authors are just so masterful in using tropes that people love, um, but finding ways to make them new and exciting. And the guarantee with a romance novel is that it's going to end happily, but you have to get really creative to make that entertaining and make people want to read despite knowing how it'll end. Right. So one of my favorites is Kate Claiborne. She's just super good at the emotional part of love stories and having really romantic little moments all along the way and like really building up the love story and on also at just cute fun banter and things like that and so it's her books always afterwards I just like lay on the floor and have to process because it was so good (laughs) (laughs) so that says a lot (laughs) yes so she's one of my favorites and then Rachel and Solomon writes young adult and adult and is just super witty and creative. And her first couple books were not romances, but ever since then she's done romance and romantic comedy. And it's just totally, you can tell it's totally like she's hit her stride. It's so good. Um, And then a book I think everyone should read, not actually romance. You might be surprised to hear, (laughs) but a YA author who's been at it for a long time is Deb Coletti. And she like she's been publishing since before the big YA boom of the 2010s. Yes, I know that author. Yeah, yeah, I think she won a oh she won one of the big awards back in like 04. <laughs> and so she's been just like really in the game for a long time but still puts out really consistently wonderful and powerful books. And my favorite by her is called A Heart in a Body in the World and I think it came out in 2018. So kind of in a time that I was really getting into trying to write and publish or I'd been writing but was really trying to start to look into publishing but it was just a super inspiring book to me that is about a lot of the um, nuanced and complicated and difficult experiences that girls and young women have through growing up and dealing with sexism and yeah finding your voice and strength and things like that. It's hard to describe the like full plot, but it's about a girl who basically experiences a really traumatic event and runs across the country. <laughs> like oh, wow. she goes, she just starts running one day and doesn't stop. And it is so good. I highly recommend it to anyone. And it just made me want to tell stories about that kind of girl character and that depict not just like the light and fun parts of life and being a young woman and falling in love, but also all the complicated stuff. Yeah. So important, I think, for young women to to find something like that in a book, because I don't think you can be female and not <laughs> sometimes think about, well, why does that, why is this happening yeah. to me? Or what, what power do I have to like say something or, or stand up for myself? Or is it going to come off being one way or another? So right. yeah, that's great. So are you working on another book and can you share any details with us? Yes. So love from scratch. The first one came out this past spring. I realized about halfway through talking to you that I just had not even said the name of my book this whole time. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead. You, you can, you can pitch your book a little bit there. <laughs> I imagined you would talk about it probably at some point too in your intro, but yes. yes, Love from Scratch was the first book that is a romantic comedy about two teenage interns on a, an online cooking channel. And so my next book comes out next spring and it's called Not Here to Stay Friends. And it it takes place on around a teen reality dating show. So I'm kind of doing a little trilogy of you don't have to read them in order. They're standalone. But I'm doing a little set of three kind of reality TV adjacent stories. Oh, okay. And so we did the cooking show thing. And the second one is the reality dating show inspired by my 
longtime love for the terrible and amazing Bachelor franchise. And <laughs> yeah, and then the third one is the one I'm drafting right now or working on, yeah, the first draft of that's going to be kind of an amazing race type thing in the wilderness. That Not is, naked and afraid. No, although... <laughs> The Yeah, the premise of the show has a little more in common with what they actually do on Naked and Afraid, just no nakedness. So okay. I really did not want to use that as a like comparison title. Definitely right. Amer- Amazing Race sounds more like the vibe I'm going for. But yeah, that one's called Wild About You and it'll be out summer 2024. So next up is Not Here to Stay Friends next spring. And that can be like pre-ordered already. And then... Yeah, so that one's basically done by now, and I'm working on writing the third. (laughs) All right, so you're right in the middle of the writing process. All right. Well, so this is the question I get to ask all our our people who come on our podcast, and it is, what are you reading? Wonderful. I am pretty often reading via audiobook. I love audiobooks and check out a ton from the library, <laughs> Lexington Public Library. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. But I, yeah, recently listened to one called Thank You for Listening by Julia Whalen that just came out, I think this month. And Julia Whalen is an audiobook narrator and an author. And so this is her, only her second book, I think. But it was so, so good. It's a romance, but it's also kind of women's fiction crossover. It's a lot about the main character's personal journey um, while she's also falling in love. But it is about two audiobook narrators who work on a book together. And there's a little bit of you've got male mistaken identity. Like, I don't know who you, you don't know you're talking to the same person that online that is actually this person in real life or whatever, because they use both have stage names for narrating and yeah so they're working on a book together and are possibly falling in love but it was just super cool because it's a fascinating look into the world of audiobook narration which i think is so interesting and romance audiobooks in particular is such a insular kind of world that people have their favorite narrators and a bunch of the same ones do a ton of books and Julia is a really, really good narrator. And so she narrates the audiobook of the book she wrote. It's all very meta, but right. <laughs> um, the audiobook of this one in particular, I think, is the way to read it because she talks a ton about the things happening in audiobook recording. And it's, I think, really cool to listen to it, like her doing the actual voices and oh, yeah, all of that. I know that's, I mean, when you find someone that you really like or it really works, I, remember listening to this is gonna this is gonna be a while ago but a children's book the unfortunate events the lemony snicket books yeah and tim curry had read so so good and he had read all of them and then daniel handler lemony snicket decided he was going to read one and it was so terrible (laughs) no no offense Daniel Handler. Uh, it was just not good and i was Put it in. I thought it was going to be Tim Curry. And check and I <laughs> li- different and I experience. Like, no, that's been funny with my so. book coming out because it has an audio book. Both the first one has one already out, and then the second one is going to have an audio book. I was going to ask and you that because I yeah, yeah okay. It, it's it's very cool and weird to listen to because it is like a professional voice actor narrating it, and for me that's a fun experience because it's like. It's wow. Awesome. Yeah. It's like an actor, like acting out my book. But people have asked me since the first one came out, whenever they hear there's an audio book, they're like, oh, do you narrate it? <laughs> and I'm like, you do not want that. It would be so bad if I narrated it. I cannot do people's voices and not sound like really distracting and terrible because like, what is that weird man voice she's trying to do? Well, Caitlin, thank you so much for being on the podcast. We've really enjoyed having you here and continued success on your books and hope to have you back. Thank you so much. This has been really fun. Thank you for coming. Hi, everyone. I'm Erin, the producer for Turning the Page. Welcome to our segment called Behind the Scenes. Each month, I'll take a step out from behind the scenes to introduce you to someone else at the library whose work is also typically out of the public eye. Today, I'm talking with Amanda Wheeler, Experiential Learning Supervisor, and Brian Klausing, Digital Studio Supervisor, about the library's experiential learning spaces. 
Thank you both for joining me for Behind the Scenes for Turning the Page. So we are going to just hop right in about experiential learning. So Amanda, can you tell us what experiential learning is? Yeah, absolutely. So experiential learning is really learning by doing and then reflecting on either the process or the product and just being really intentional with that experience. In this way, it really allows participants to explore and really think about their product and what they're doing and creating. We actually offer lots of hands-on learning opportunities in the experiential learning spaces. And in a lot of the programs, we use the engineering design process where they can design their project, put it together, test it out, evaluate it, and then make changes as necessary. Awesome. So how does experiential learning benefit all ages? So it's really important for lifelong learning. So really important for everyone because it lets them explore and create, really lets them show off that creativity. I know that I personally learn better when I'm doing things rather than just listening about it. And it really just allows participants that creativity because we're not telling them exactly what to do. We're kind of giving them parameters, giving them equipment and letting them run with it. It just allows them to take risks, learn from their mistakes, and just really gives them those learning opportunities. I think uh, another key component to that is peer-to-peer learning. Oftentimes, as folks are doing, you know, whatever project they're working on, you'll see them helping one another out. I see that very frequently in the Jizzle studio as people are working on their own projects. And, and, you know, you'll often, you know, see people troubleshooting and jump in to help people just be go on. Someone in the studio yesterday told me, you know, two brains are better than one as we were kind of kind of helping out in their layout on the book that he was working on. Awesome. And sometimes it's just helpful too. like you may not be super confident in what you're doing, but if someone is sitting beside you like that just gives you the little slight edge that you need to figure it out even on your own. So, Brian, the digital studio has been around for almost 15 years, which blew my mind when I did the math. It opened in 2008 with Northside Branch when it was rebuilt. So can you update us on that space and the programs that are now being offered? I just launched probably a couple months ago offering the the classes and workshops again, you know, in the in the studio space. This past weekend I did a record a song workshop in the production studio, which uh, folks know is the green screen room. And we, we started from scratch and, and recorded a, a song. I had about eight, eight to twelve people and it was a very hands-on process. Everyone got to record, everybody got to engineer, and then we all kind of worked together on the mix down. And that's very common, you know, with the project-based offerings that we have. Like Amanda said, we kind of go through the whole process. We've offered Create Your Own Flyer. We did a video editing. I'm very excited in September, we're going to be offering a three-session class on graphic design basics. And the one in September is going to be in, in Spanish. We have a community member, Alberto, who's going to be coming in and teaching that. We'll offer that again, you know, in November, the English version of that. And we also have some new equipment. The audio booth, I'm speaking in a, in a very high quality road tube microphone that's got a very a smooth and silky sound that, that you'll find very common in a lot of high-end studio spaces. We have a, a very cool machine drum pad. We got some cool keyboards. In the production studio, we now have wireless microphones. We have a Canon RP mirrorless camera. We have a black magic unit that will allow multicasting for live streaming. So yeah, very excited about all the spaces and, and you know, you can check the library's website to see which classes are offering. But folks can take the classes and then also come in and, you know, work on their own projects. The studio still has the Adobe Suites, which is probably one of the coolest features in it, you know, because that is so pricey, you know, for anyone to do. So just having access to that resource to have Photoshop and Premiere Pro and Illustrator is a great way to kind of get in learning those softwares. And I've talked to many people that has said that they've, from working in the studio, they've been able to launch careers you know, from that. That's wonderful. So Amanda, a quick curveball question that I didn't include in your list. Tell me about the STEAM Lab. Yeah, absolutely. So the STEAM Lab opened in March. It's the Clipper Foundation STEAM Lab. And we have an audio booth. We have our drop-in hours. So make sure that you check out the website to know what activities we're doing for the different weeks. We have a collab lab. 
3D printer, all sorts of cool technology in the space, really targeted for that third grade and up range, and lots of really cool programming, hands-on experiences for them in the STEAM lab. So lots of really cool stuff going on, especially for no school days and things like that as well. So the Makerspace at Eastside has been a really cool resource since it opened, but it's been closed for a couple of years and it's getting ready to reopen. So tell me what is going to be happening in that new space. Yeah, absolutely. So we're so excited to be relaunching the Makerspace at Eastside. It's going to open the end of September. It's going to have lots of really cool technology in there for the community. We're going to have a tabletop kiln. We're going to have a large format printer. With that large format printer, we have lots of different papers and vinyls and things that they'll be able to print on. So we even have outdoor material and grommets so they could make banners. We have a large format laminator. We're going to have a button maker, 3D printers, sewing machines. It's really going to be a cool crafty space, community space, small business space. We're really excited. It's going to be for teens and adults. So it's going to be that 13 and up age range. And we're really just excited for this space to be kind of a work area. I know that's something that a lot of people don't have, just kind of a quiet space so that they can focus on whatever they're working on but also an inspiration to people. They can collaborate with others while they're in this space, see what other people are working on, and hopefully get some inspiration from that as well. Wonderful. So Brian, what is the target age of the digital studio? I would say a teen on up through adult, very much in the lifelong learning. So, you know, what's what's cool about all three spaces is that they all work very well in tandem. So the STEAM lab will introduce ideas to the middle schoolers. And then as they grow, you know, then op- opens up opportunities to both the makerspace and the digital studio. You know, one thing I'm really excited about on the makerspace side is that folks that come into the digital studio can use Photoshop shop or illustrator to like make a logo, for instance, and any kind of graphic design project and then go over to the East Side Makerspace and then print out a, a banner or buttons for their small businesses. I mean, how cool is that going to be? It's going to be amazing. It's going to be so fun. So what is your favorite thing, each of you, that you've done in the past year in the experiential learning spaces? And yes, I realize I'm asking you about your favorite child. <laughs> It's so hard to pick because there have just been so many awesome collaborators and presenters and programs that we've done. The Kluger Foundation STEAM Lab has only been open since March, but we've packed in a ton of really high quality programming. Probably, since I have to pick, probably my favorite one has been virtual reality just because One, it's really cool. The first time I ever put on our new Oculus Quest 2s, it just blew my mind. It is amazing. And I've had so many comments from parents and students saying, you know, we couldn't afford these. They're very expensive. We couldn't afford these. We're so glad to have this opportunity at the STEAM Lab to be able to use these technologies that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to have access to. So it's been really, really cool. I've had some students tell me that, you know, they want to design virtual reality experiences now, or they want to do coding and video games and things now. So it's really just kind of opening up the door to these experiences for the community. How about you, Brian? Well, I'm going to talk about two and and they're they're kind of related. So over the summer, we did a week-long camp with local hip-hop artist and activist Divine Karama. And he worked with middle school students and he walk them through the process of of recording a song material that he's going to use on his next album, his producer, JK47. And it was remarkable to watch the kids as they started to go into the audio booth, be really shy. And then by the end of the week, they were rapping and they were just having a great time. What was really cool is that they continued to come in and ask to use the space to keep recording because that, you know, having that spark or, or seeing someone that that you can model after to show what's possible is is crucial in, in these kinds of areas. So being able to have them work with a professional working musician can be life changing. Just a couple of weeks ago, we, we had an artist from Berea, Christy, who came in and recorded a song to help the flood victims in eastern Kentucky. And she brought in a videographer who recorded a music video in, in the space and engineered some of it. And 
I actually end up being in the video. They asked me to be it. But what was really cool was afterwards is that three of the kids that were in, in the Divines workshop then came in to the studio and, and got to talk to Christy. And Christy's a very country singer. That's Dolly Parton. And, and you wouldn't think that, you know, those two, because they were big fans of hip hop and you wouldn't think th those would blend, but, you know, they, they loved it. They loved the song. They were listening to it. They were asking her questions about if she wrote it. You know, they're asking her, they were very inquisitive, which is what you want to hear. And, you know, the videographer, the end was saying, well, you know, if you three, it has to be all three of you, you guys write me a song and, and put and produced it, then I'll film a video for you. And, and that's, that's what these spaces are like is, you know, you want those kinds of interactions, you know, those chance meetings that, that can lead to other projects or other amazing things. So since this is a library podcast, we ask everybody this at the end of our interviews. What are you reading? Yeah, so I am currently reading The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Cool. I just finished Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John. I'm a huge fan of hers. Station Eleven is one of my favorite. It's in my top 10 books, and it was a terrific read. Well, thank you both for joining me for Behind the Scenes. This was actually a pretty unique interview because you guys are both in your audio booths at your respective locations and I am in my closet at home. So this is a really cool way to show off our experiential spaces in a different kind of way. So thank you both so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Turning the Page, a podcast brought to you by Lexington Public Library staff. If you've enjoyed listening, please take a moment to subscribe, rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any questions or suggestions for future podcasts, you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublive.org. That's elibrarian at l-e-x-p-u-b-l-i-b dot org. I'm Jennifer, and we'll be back to turn another page.